Monday. Happy Monday, everybody. Yo. Look at that. Oh. 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 What? What? Oh. What? Oh. Wait, what's something different? Lag, lag, test, lag, lag, mm. test, test, lag. Check, check, check. Hold on. Let's look. Uh, uh, can we do the bit where we make it look like we're touching each other? Oh, oh. You, you, you can do either. You got oh, the right right. way. I guess we could just do this. That's the thing. Whoa. Yeah, exactly. Whoa. Whoa. There it just, is. Yeah, that's the easier way. I'm in Austin. Mm, 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 He's mm, in Austin. Do not adjust mm. your sets. I flew to Austin. I'm place, house hunting. Place some bets. Don't uh, adjust your sets. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, there's a lot of a uh, lot of looking at things and uh, a lot of thinking, lot not of thinking, thinking, thinking about thinking. Yeah. Uh, but it's nice, Austin. It's how the weather always is, right? Oh. <laughs> you know? Yes, that is the great lie that we love you know, to it's, sell. It's like uh, it's 60 a, it's, to 70 degrees every day oh, here. Oh, man. They, they no wonder everybody's moving like the here. Heat. The weather is great. As goes <laughs> February, goes all the rest of the year uh, yeah. in Austin. Yeah. There was a nice settling uh, fog here in uh, the, the, the puppy. We, we do get that a fair bit. I, I like the fog mornings because they're extra silent, you know? Yeah. Because that fog, like, disperses. I was realizing I woke up early this morning on my normal schedule to go mm -hmm. run. I normally run the lake in Oakland and then realized that uh, I should not be running on the country roads out here in the puppy because all of my running gear is black and Ooh. I would get run over. <laughs> like yeah. there's definitely no sidewalks. Not a sidewalk or bike here trails. yet. So it's fine during the day when people can see me, but <laughs> not, eh, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It will during, be pretty nice day. after, you know, the government seizes all of my property without, you know, using mm. the force of law. Mm. You should make us think about it. Get on the news. Like that Koresh fellow? Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> I got acreage too. <laughs> be pretty good promo. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I can, uh, you know, cut my hair in a crazy way. Yeah. Like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, imagine, imagine that. No, you with uh, crazy hair. What would that uh, even look like? Okay. So, so, so here's the threat is when I do cut my hair, I'm going to do the full Prince Adam. I'm going to do the, the bangs across and the down. All right, Andrew, rank Brian haircuts. Spikes, where it is now, or the full page boy, the, 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 the Dutch boy haircut. Rank those Brian haircuts one through three for you. Uh, I mean, this guy looks like a music teacher that I would not trust my daughter to go take <laughs> lessons from. <laughs> <laughs> with a faked comb over too. Oh, he's you're like, not wrong. I just, uh? I'll be like, uh, yeah, no, he's a really great teacher. I'm like, eh, yeah. you know, music's not your thing, dude. Exactly. You know? <laughs> That's like a music yeah. teacher, a music teacher that uh, uh, you just see a text saying like, hey, we got to work on your fingering next session. <laughs> <laughs> like, All right. All right. This is, this is, this is a guy that has been at a Ren Fair within the last year. <laughs> I think that's accurate. Uh, oh, well, no, not no, the COVID, COVID year. COVID, yeah. yeah, yeah. It was an off year. In all, no, in all, in all. He was at some years. secret Ren Fair. <laughs> His own Ren Fair. The, the alternative if Renaissance you hear, if, you, if you say the words bardic circle, you just, you know. Hey, hey, hey. Like a meerkat. Yeah. All right. You guys want to start the Weird Things podcast? Let's go. Ready, ready. All right. I'm going to count you in, Andrew. In three, two. Hello and welcome to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Adrian Mean, joined by Justin Robert Young. Hello. Mr. Brian Brushwood. Live from Austin, Texas. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. I'm also live from Austin, Texas. Brian and me always live from Austin, yep. Texas. Uh, yep. That's how it always is. I'm also live from Austin, Texas, what? What? guys. Uh, oh, how did you get, how'd you get here? I'm here. Oh, my I'm God. here. Yeah, I'm house hunting and uh, I'm here. So I'm very excited to be here and I'm very excited to get weird. Yeah, I'm 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 not in Austin. No. Mm. No. No. Not yet. Not. You know where I could be? Where? I could be in space. You could. You could. Was 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 that a Super Bowl ad last night? Did I did I imagine that? Did I did I hallucinate <laughs> that they said go to space and that was the whole no, ad? Brian. We we had uh, you know, we know it's 2021 because we had a 5 second ad from Reddit championing the fact that you know wall street memes was able to uh well you know or wall street bets was able to like take on 
at least for a short period of time, the hedge fund industry. And then we also had an ad that says, hey, uh, sign up. You could be chosen to go to space into this year. Oh, wow. I guess I did not see that. I must have been away from the the, the, the laptop when this happened. I, I did not even I, I even see this uh, uh, ad. So wait, what is what is this? Th this, I believe this is the story we talked about. Is this the one that goes around the moon? No, 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 that's a different no, that, one. That's, that's a private that's dish. Right, right, yeah. right, right, right. Okay. Well, then I don't know what no. this is. So this was just announced a couple of weeks ago. Jared Isaacman, who is the founder and CEO of Shift for Payments, who I never, I never even heard of him or it until this was announced. But apparently, he's very wealthy, and he went to SpaceX and said, "Hey, how much to put like four average Joes, including myself?" But he's actually a pilot too. Like he like like collects like jet planes and stuff. But like, how much to put four people onto? Uh, your rocket and they're like oh cool yeah we can make this happen and so i guess he's selecting they're sending four humans to space himself and then uh they're going to pick three other people basically you can donate or you can just email whatever to he's trying to raise money for saint jude's hospital so he's doing this as a fundraiser too to basically help donate you know and get things going I also promote his business i think it's smart i have no problem any with anything he's doing i think it's all cool what he's doing so basically himself and three other people Given them a chance to win a ticket to space. Wow. This will be like world. legit space. Yeah. What a crazy world. You know, th there was a lot of stuff because Tom Brady's so old and he keeps winning Super Bowls uh, that like we're pointing out all the commercials were there that, that were airing during his first Super Bowl. And a lot of it are businesses that are no longer with us and, and, in, in, uh, you know, like uh, businesses and verticals that no longer exist. I'll be proud when we look back at 2021 and say, oh, this was the first year that people were advertising space travel, right? At, at, at a point in a few years from now when it's like, hey, uh, book your family's space vacation. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be pumped to say 2021. That was when the first time somebody advertised a trip to space on the Super Bowl. Advertised in a non-adjacent way, not in a... Uh the same people who bring you scotch tape also bring you Velcro, which is used <laughs> on the moon. Space, it's great. Buy 3M. That was, you know, yeah, like, that's, that's uh, especially in such a weird year, that those ads were so weird in, in, in just being like, like, uh, like some very dramatic situation where there's like a car accident and somebody's calling the hospital and then it's like, at Chipotle, we very <laughs> much believe in fresh ingredients. And it's like, uh, uh, this one at least was straight ahead. This was just, we're sending people to space. You want to go to space? Come on up to space. This isn't a, a thing for another thing. This isn't Bruce Springsteen talking about how we need to heal America so we can sell a Jeep. Like, this is, this is just go to space. So you can go to inspiration4.com. Um, for some people, they're like, man, this looks a lot like the Fantastic Four logo, and we know how that turned out. Uh, awesome. Oh, yeah. For three out of four of them, one of them yeah. slunk into a crippling depression and later would stay on an alien world just so he could pretend to be human for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but he always got, like, met beautiful women, though. That's the thing. Yeah. Yeah, but nobody wanted Ben Graham's, like, the depressed guy. Like, he looks at the hot girlfriend. You're like, what? What? What is your problem? Look at how people look at your girlfriend's beautiful. She's blind. It doesn't matter. She's beautiful. <laughs> She's a fox, you moron. <laughs> <laughs> people are gonna look at me weird. You're made of rocks. You're invulnerable. Yeah, like, you're like, the funniest you... one in the group. Like, like everyone yeah. likes you. Like, <laughs> yeah. my name is synonymous with the gross one. Come on, guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I think Johnny Storm's living this. You know, the the, the these one fever dream away from emulating you know his girlfriend or whoever's with them if you think about it you oh, know yeah that really it really was like three so. uh, three of the four names were like badass and then the fourth one is like i don't know how about the gross what about thing? scuzz bucket <laughs> yeah what what about the thing under your shoe that you just wish you could yeah. grow gross so we no guarantee that you'll be exposed to cosmic radiation and get superpowers, but there's no guarantee you so won't. won't. Yeah. So what they're they're saying here, if I can read this uh, uh, website correctly, is he is going for the different elements of of like what generosity, prosperity, hope, and then he is slotting himself in as leadership, which I guess you get to do when you're chartering a 
a trip to space. Yeah, when you're yeah. when you're literally leading the yeah when thing. you're when you're a literal leader. Uh, <laughs> generosity Mer- is like uh, generosity. All the people funding my journey to space. Prosperity, a reflection of the money that allowed me to go to space. Hope, my wishes that I'll be able to go to space. Uh, Leadership, me. The end. Andrew, as somebody who has worked uh, uh, creating television, and Brian as well, uh, <laughs> when I look at that, it feels very adaptable to a television or web medium where where unscripted reality type of thing yeah i mean you don't have to make it it's not full bachelor i don't think you have to do but but certainly just highlighting great work that people have done the kind of people that are attracted to it explaining the desire to go to space it seems like something that would be very on 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 brand and and exhibitionable i guess for for a lack of a better word do, do you think that they might take that in that direction they got to be getting calls from hollywood saying hey can we document this right considering that bryce dallas howard shot the commercial yeah uh i here's here's this like i you know years ago i hear people like oh you know we could pay for a trip to mars if we just like and they go like i got an idea like what is reality tv and i'm like you don't know how reality tv works you have no little idea how much money is in it which is not that much and two reality tv is all about very bad personalities people you would not want to be friends with you know who you don't put into space? Right. People you would not want yeah. to be friends people with. People who are going to create drama. Like the, the that's they literally test for that, where it's like, yeah. are you somebody who can put things behind you, who can get along, who can understand that the mission comes first and all that stuff? Yeah, if you follow astronauts, like when you meet like the people who are like the best ones, like they're super brilliant, super smart people. They literally are annoying because they are like perfect people. You know, not not all astronauts. Let me make that very clear. I'm talking about the Hashtag ones that not like, all astronauts. Yeah, the ones that keep getting selected again and again. They're like they go home and read their newspaper. Or, you know, they play with the dog. They go do this, and you're like, how how who lives like this? You know. And so I would say that I think there's probably kind of a really it could be a great movie, a great documentary in there or something. There's absolutely something great. I don't. There could be a great story there, but I, I it'll take some work to sort of pull it out. Yeah, I, I don't I don't think that it's necessarily going to be reality television in, in, in the tropes per se. But I do think that there there are models even there, like like an undercover boss or 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 maybe if you just took out all the good hearted uh segments of of Shark Tank or something like well, that. And- where where you are rooting for underdogs to do a thing and, and you're choosing amongst good options. And and I think that that there's some amount like you can't stop some amount of the media circus from happening. I mean, and and you know, unfortunately, the closest parallel that 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 springs to mind is you know the the shortly before the Challenger disaster. You know, it's like that was so exciting and so relatable of an average citizen going up to space. Uh, I guess we saw it again with Dennis Tito and and with our friend Richard Garriott. Um, Two yeah. average guys, two just average blue collar guys. Well, I mean, you know, not, not, you know, well, okay. I mean, but, but, but that being said, we're in a, a media age now where he could just pay a great director, a great director of photography to do YouTube things that would put up and that would capture uh, uh, the attention. He could certainly probably land a, a big sponsor to at least pay for that, uh, uh, a, production for it if what he really wants is just exposure i mean i'm sure he could book himself yeah. on plenty of talk shows and stuff like that to talk about it as as people become more invested yeah i think you know it'll it'll i think what you guys were saying is like you get get people involved in the people you yes. know once we meet the faces of who this is and you like you know bob and doug who those guys were like a year before and then all oh little kids like i like bob and doug and because like they're just these super likable guys and you know, NASA has an incredible media machine and, and, you know, there is way more than people realize. Uh, and it did a great job of all of a sudden people knew who Bob and Doug were. And, and here, this is not NASA. This is going to be, uh, um, you know, this is a totally disowned, but I mean, when Isaac has got the money to pour into this and buy Super Bowl spots and stuff, and just a quick aside, like I would say for, we you get it, but maybe, you know, a lot of our listeners do, but a lot of people don't understand how much of everything you see that comes that comes from celebrities, politicians, or CEOs 
get filtered through PR firms. Yeah. You know, you'll hear, oh, so and so just came out with a book. Yeah, because they sat down 10 months ago with their pub their PR team and they said, What do we need to do? And they're like, How about a book? And they're like, I don't have time to write a book. And they laughed at them, like, you're not gonna write the book. We're gonna have somebody else write the book for you, but we're gonna tell your story. CEOs do this all the time, you know, right before they're gonna make their exit or when they're trying to justify who they are. Politicians do this, whatever, and it's all part of that manufactured process. And so they're systems in place that you can yes. say, hey, I've got money to put into this. Let's go make this work. Yeah. Oh, oh, totally. And and I don't think that you slip and fall and accidentally buy a Super Bowl ad directed by Bryce Dallas Howard, right? <laughs> like yeah. that is that is a very deliberate step forward because you are looking to establish in the mind share of America and, and all ships at sea that this is a thing that's happening. Get ready. Be excited. It's going to be super fun. Yeah, and you don't just slip and fall and find yourself on the talk show circuit like, oh, they just called me up and I wanted to this. Like, no, oh, the, the yeah. people you paid a lot of money to called in favors and, you know. Exactly, exactly. I mean, there are times when the talk shows are like, oh, we want to do a thing and, and they might reach out to somebody. But otherwise, no, this is, there's an entire ecosystem that makes the wheels go round on, on this kind of stuff. Yeah, I saw... I'd see I'd see some of that kind of horse trading too, like when I worked with like network stuff and all that, because like, you know, I'd like sometimes I'd get a contact and the next thing I know, like the PR thing from the network person would be pulling them aside, like, hey, listen, I need to get so and so on this week, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know. Yeah. Um and I think I once had somebody try to trade my spot away for somebody else's spot too. Really? Not realizing I was in the email chain, not realizing it was my contact. I'm like, oh, what if we put so and so instead or whatever? And I'm like, Hello, it's my contact. This Hi, is, I still put here. you in touch with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah I was awkward. <laughs> well, you want to know what's not awkward, Andrew? That is supporting us at patreon.com slash weird things. At patreon.com slash weird things. You not only get the self-satisfaction of keeping this show uh, uh, live and independent each and every Monday, but also you get your custom RSS feed. You put it in the podcatcher of your choice. You get the After Things podcast before anybody else, it's just that simple. Weird things, or sorry, uh, uh, patreon.com slash weird things. Or as we like to say, why go to the stars when you can be a star, a star in our hearts, mm -hmm. a heart star at weird things. Be a heart star. Patreon.com slash weird things. So uh, we have a new person entering into the workforce. Um, looks like they're stepping down from their job and Maybe going to focus on some hobbies. Maybe they need a new job. And that is Mr. Uh, Jeff Bezos. Big money Bezos. Ooh. Got a little bit more time on his hand. So speculation is about, so Jeff Bezos is stepping down from being the CEO of Amazon. And uh, Andrew Jassy is going to step in, who'd been running the web services, which tells you really what where the money is in Amazon. And I mean, now, just, just a, is, yeah, a, a, a remarkable thing, just just because I want to I want to touch on this. And, and I've been, you know, because there are political consequences and tech consequences, I've been spending a lot of time with this story. But it really bears mentioning if we're if we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about Jassy. But that man turned Amazon's biggest expense into its biggest profit center. There was a time in which the thing that they spent the most money on was hosting, they pioneered AWS, which is the concrete by which the internet is made on, and now it is, they own a third of a market where I think the next largest is 8% or something like that. Like, they are just absolutely insane. Bezos had previously stepped away from day-to-day -day operations and with the rumors kind of being that he wanted to make this move in 2020. Then 2020 happened, Amazon basically ran the infrastructure for society for uh, uh, certainly the first half of the year and has continued to at a, at a larger capacity. But this, this is now him actually not only doing what he had done before, stepping back from day-to-day -day activities, but fully saying, this is the new guy. I'm ascending to uh, a, a higher echelon on the board. But I think what, Andrew, you're getting at is that it might also mean he's going to get a lot more hands-on with some of his other projects. Yeah, and chief among them might be Blue Origin, which Blue Origin was started two years before SpaceX, and it has not had the kind of record that SpaceX has had. 
but they've done some interesting cool things and there is and i would say that there has been i'm I'm not going to get into kind of the uh kind of the 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 shady sort of back and forth the stuff of like blue origin like trying to patent you know landing on a barge and other stuff which i think wasn't really helpful in trying to lock spacex out of a launch pad there's some stuff there that i don't think was really didn't help the look of blue origin and whatnot and maybe there's the allegation that spacex did similar things so i don't want to get into that but their BE4 engines, the next generation engines they developed are really cool. They built a really neat, you know, reusable suborbital rocket system. We've yet to see them put a payload into orbit, which, you know, for a space company that is 20 years old now, um, I think it's time, <laughs> you know, and I think that they have the they they have the people, they yeah. have a lot of capability, but I would say part of the problem is is that like when Jeff was just off writing checks you know, and out there running Amazon, you probably have a different sort of sense of pressure than if you're SpaceX and Elon's telling you like, yeah, no, if we don't get this NASA contract, uh, we're going to have to let a lot of people go. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, and that's, that's the thing is for Blue Origin, they're in any other, in any other time frame, they'd be like, oh, wow, what a productive space company. <laughs> you've made some mm-hmm. rockets. Like, it looks like you've actually done some testing. That's really cool. What tremendous promise, Blue Origin. Unfortunately, they are contemporaries with SpaceX, which has just redefined the game of what a successful private rocket company should be. Well, and, and along those lines, uh, help me remember what the benefits to anything suborbital is like i i assume you can you know do launch overs to get spy pictures for the duration of one launch or whatever but but i mean it seems like like if you can't get to orbit you're very very limited right well that's not that's not they're not like like virgin space or whatever that that's like their only thing they've been building the be4 engine which is going to be powering uh like like the vulcan rocket or other rocket rockets for other companies or like lockheed or whatever they work they have partners that are building stuff so they're understand outside of spacex and blue origin there has not been a new like american like rocket engine in something like 30 something years or something or 40 years it's crazy and so and that's like to justin's point if the spacex didn't exist we'd be like hey finally and there are people who are like Oh, we don't know how to make them anymore. And like even American Aerospace, ah, it's the Russians of the metal experts, really. It's it's a lost thing there. But if you want to spend $5 billion and help us, we, we'll get it back. And then they went and did it, you know, privately. So it's going to be used in the Vulcan Centaur and then the new Glenn. So they have their lineup of rockets they want to build. Uh, if you see that, they have they want to do drone ship landing too. They want to do all this. They want to build the new Glenn. Then they have the new, you know, these all like the they have the new Shepard, which they have now, the new Glenn. So they plan on building their own big reusable rockets um it's just i think the the pacing is I, just yeah I, I i'm so excited for this i'm 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 truly excited because i think that not only is blue origin again only lagging because spacex exists but also spacex is, has trailblazed a lot of ground there there's there's a there's a big old slip and slide that that blue origin is going to be able to use now because a lot of these things, at least we've seen successful examples of what's happening. And I think that if there's one thing that we can have a billionaire versus billionaire guys who are going back and forth, trading the title of richest man in the world, depending on where Tesla stock is at any one moment. Uh, uh, if, if we want to benefit from a demeasuring contest between those guys, the, the, the winner will be humanity as we uh, try to traverse the, the stars. And it's, I don't know if we need to do it for this audience, but every time I tweet something about space, I get the, we need to spend this money on Earth, you know? Well, excuse me, I'm going to go back to playing, you know, some video game for five hours because I'm really an effective measure of how we should be spending time and resources. Um, and... It, it is it is one of these things where and uh, you know it's the people who yell the loudest are kind of the least informed and it's like there are a number of technologies that and not just because everything that goes into space are astronauts use but aerospace materials all these sort of things if you look at like what's used in prosthetic limbs and a lot of the stuff we're using things carbon fibers materials that came from aerospace if you look at a lot of a lot of technologies whenever you try to solve a problem that's a big problem in some direction it benefits everything else, not to mention when we look at what happens with 
experiments done in space. Like we've been able to, you know, 20 years ago, we we're making protein crystals bigger than we saw that helped us understand what happens inside things like insulin and other things. So there are so many to, to think that you can just say, it's not worth the effort is like, you know, electricity. Come on. We have steam. Why, spend why, more money on steam. Why would we need to uh, spend all this money sailing the Atlantic? We could, that could be best use here. Uh, uh, Look, uh, oh, I, I, there are some people to argue that we shouldn't have. Just, <laughs> yeah. I would agree that there's a lot of priorities here on Earth, which is why we want to explore space as efficiently and cheaply as possible. And I am very excited that SpaceX and Blue Origin are pioneering ways to make that happen, as opposed to the gigantic money suck that we had before that basically, in return, gave us what three lost uh decades of space progress well there was i mean there i would say the nasa story the smaller missions and the and the deep space probes and those things those are amazing that's an amazing yeah. level of success anything be it bigger and, and i get I, on my twitter feed i have like oh well, like well nasa star for funding this is embarrassing and i'm like how much more money do you want to spend on the James Webb Space Telescope? This person doesn't even know what that is. You know, how much more money do you want to spend on SLS? They don't know what I'm talking about. You know, but like, like that's part of the problem. Is you get a lot of these people, they just don't even know. You know, it's like, you know, let me tell you guys how to play Hearthstone. Exactly. You can't. We know it all. Speaking of which, did, did you ever announce that you hit ledge? Of course, yeah. yeah. Mobile only legend player. I'm the mulp. Well done. Hashtag mulp. Cool. Cool. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know what that means. Uh, just hashtag mulp, M O L P. Just everybody right now, just mulp it, mulp it up. Uh, number one mulp. That's me. Uh, I'm I'm pumped. I'm pumped to see Bezos put more time into this. So, what do you think if if we're going to say in a year? Oh, this is definitely a sign that Jeffy B put his put his uh, uh, a shoulder into this with with Blue Origin Andrew what do you think we'd see uh he's got this amazing facility in Cape Canaveral like it's really cool you go there and you see this big facility he's built this really cool machine you can see how they've taken a lot of the stuff kind of like from some of the Amazon ways they do stuff to do it but it's just not the same kind of like um efforts the new glenn is going to be the thing we really need to see like it'll be fine to put the b4 onto you know engine into another rocket engine but it's going to be great they made an engine to have their own vehicle with a reasonable upper stage is really going to be the big deal i have no idea when we're going to see that they've been showing the new shepherd you know like they're going to start doing suborbital flights where people can go on there and go do that i'm like that's cool but like you built you built a theme park ride yeah. You know, you built a theme park right there. And not to say discount, like Brian asked earlier, what's the value? There's value for like one tr astronaut training, weightlessness, or certain kinds of experiments you can do with a few minutes of microgravity. There's a lot of value there. But yeah, it's not. You look at that, you're like, cool. Let's go watch a Falcon 9. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you right. know, uh, so I kind of think he's got all the money. Who knows what they're working on? Like we, we could see a, a we could see a new Glenn on a launch pad tomorrow and yeah. not know that it was coming. Uh, I'm excited because I, I would, I would love to see that level of progress. I would love to see, uh, uh, a, a Pepsi to space, uh, SpaceX's Coke. I think it would benefit everybody. It would like the, the yeah. human race. It would benefit. So speaking of space, uh, Avi Loeb uh, was one of the astronomers when we had the, and I'm bringing this up, it's not a lot of new information here, but he's got a book out. He, when Umamu, Umumu, which was the space object that came within 60 times the distance of the Earth to the moon towards the Earth, the interstellar object, which came through and we're like, what is this? Is this rendezvous with Rama? What's going on? Started slowly departing our solar system. And speculation was, ooh, is it alien? Is it this? Whatever. Uh, and we still don't know. We still have pretty good, you know, explanations of like, oh, it might be like hydrogen ice, because it was had behavior which it appeared to accelerate and move away, which if it was a comet doing outgassing, you would have seen some sort of debris, but we didn't. And so it's like, well, maybe it was hydrogen and we didn't see it. 
anyhow, Avi Loeb, who was the like chair of astronomy at Harvard, like very prestigious position, not not your average crackpot, uh, was one of the people who said, I think it's alien. And now he has a book out, uh, which is basically making the claim like, oh, yeah, I believe this was an extraterrestrial object visiting our solar system. And he's been making the rounds. Uh, and so, well, and when you say extraterrestrial object, do we mean like a conveniently shaped rock or do we mean an intentionally created spacecraft? I mean, alien. I mean, it's not the, 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 the fact that it came from another star system is nobody's questioning that he's saying alien spacecraft. Um, and it, man, I, I wonder what the heart of the ar argument is, because uh, yeah, the, the, the old skeptic canard is. When you hear hoofbeats on the horizon, think uh, horses, not unicorns. Like, I, I, I don't know why it makes it a shorter path to add intentionally created by alien people than, than what would be expected from a funky-shaped cigar-looking rock. Well, that's, he, he has, in his original paper, uh, he goes through six points. He has six points of which why he thinks it is. And, and that was there was a nature team that went and then did their take and sort of dismantled all six points saying like, you know, like point <laughs> one was like the fact that it came this close to earth would indicate that it was intentionally sent towards, you know, in our direction to go look at us or that, that, that there would be so few of these objects out there in space. The fact that it would come this close. And they're like, no, there are probably trillions of these objects, you know, in a light year, you know, cubic light year of space. They're not that rare. The telescope that observed it was switched on, and it's one of the jobs to observe these things. And we predict, like, we'll be finding these one a year. So they're like, no, it ain't that rare. He's like, it's rare. And they're like, no, it's not that rare. Um, he goes into, you know, some other arguments like that. But then, like, the motion, the fact that, like, it behaved in a very weird pattern, the luminosity of it, how bright it got, his, his, he's saying, I think it's a solar sail. He's like, I think it's a solar sail. And it was, like, tumble. But then he's like... But I think it was tumbling. It was a derelict solar sail. Like, all right, now a little unicorn like there. And he goes through, he has like, you know, his points he make, and then you can read the rebuttals to those points. But it's a, it is, I would say what's interesting to me about the argument is like, I'm frustrated by the reaction of a lot of scientists. You like people like put on Twitter, like, oh, they, like, I was asked to comment and I said, no, this guy's a crackpot. And I'm like, that's not a scientific argument. That's not, that's not science. That's mean girls. You know, that's like, you know, Carl Sagan would take on things like Velikovsky and just these crazy things. Other astronomers wouldn't even go near and say like, no, a lot of people want to know why. And if we're just going to give them people arguments from authority, I'm a prominent astronomer and I say this is stupid. Well, then you lost. Well, well and, I, and then you get into the dumb question of like, uh, 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 well, you're platforming a person with a crazy idea. And it's like, uh, yes, all people should have a platform. It's sort of baked into the First Amendment of, of, of our country's founding. Well, and I think it's in this specific issue, if we're going to go from the meta to the micro, that's the point of this podcast. <laughs> the very genesis of weird things is literally three people for whom try to think of themselves as. Uh, uh, objective and and uh, skeptical on these uh, things as possible, diving into these issues and looking at these issues and trying to establish the facts as best as we can as as amateurs. So, I'm uh, uh I, I don't know. I I I I share your um your 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 frustrations that that sometimes this is not uh. Uh, yeah, you know, this is this is too easily dismissed because people want to look cool. And I don't. I have issues with Loeb. Some of his logic too. Like, I mean, he uses all the Sherlock Holmes claim. You know, you remove the impossible, whatever remains, however unlikely is what's like. And like, well, that was Doyle. That was really. It's really a bad way to think about things because you always have the opportunity for explanation X, which everything actually is. We don't know exactly how everything works. Everything is also yeah. some version of maybe what we think is true. So I'm like, no, it's not like, oh, out of these five possibilities. No, we don't know that those are the only five. And so that's my problem. Number one is that is that like, well, it's this or it's that like, well, this could be a lot of different that, you know, this versions of what things could do. Uh, the other one is he has he's, he's been saying, like, for us to think, you know, that we are alone is the height of arrogance. And I'm like, that's an argument from emotion. And you could flip that and say for us to think that we're intelligent life is so special and neat there must be more of it could be considered arrogant it, it doesn't get you anywhere well that and also to me it's like okay i'm i'm 
cool with saying somewhere else in the galaxy, there is something that we would determine as uh, intelligent life. That to me is not the same argument as there's a spaceship that showed up and then left. Like that, exactly. that is a totally different argument. And I don't think it's arrogant to say, oh, there has to be another civilization that has a spaceship that came to earth that 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 is not something that i think is is the same as as saying oh we we might not be alone this is a big 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 play area uh so it it seems more likely that we just would never even know they existed much in the same way that everybody on earth will never know that the vast majority of the rest of earth existed yeah so i you know, I encourage, like, I'm glad he wrote a book about it. And, uh, you know, for people like, ah, people might be swayed by this. I'm like, oh, cool. I, I mean, I don't know. That, that's, that's something that you and I have had conversations both on and off air yeah. for, for years and years and years. Yeah. The, the least favorite argument on the planet is, but the dumbs will think dot, dot, dot. And I, and I, I, I despise it with every fiber I of my being. Prominent skeptics in the 90s upset with the x-files going oh it's just, it shouldn't be there because because people whose names you've heard of like people think it's true it's like it's a fictional show it has writers doesn't matter it's, the, it's dumbs, like, the dumbs the dumbs I think think yeah. more about what the dumbs will say who, who let the dumbs out <laughs> duh, duh, duh. <laughs> <laughs> Ring the dumbbell, but only in the proper manner that uh, advocates what I think the dumbs should think. Uh, so I want to veer a little bit uh, into slightly controversial here. And okay. I, I don't mean to have to talk about, I don't want to bring up, you know, the pandemic or COVID every podcast, but something interesting has happened. Matt Ridley. I mean, on I, we, his we, rational... are, we are, by the way, coming up on the year anniversary of us first talking about uh about about COVID. And it was it was right here on on this show where we were you you were you were very, very early on hey, we should pay attention to this crazy thing that's happening in China. I pulled up my Amazon record. I was buying masks in January. I pulled up to see when I was January 16th. It's when I ordered my first group of masks. Because wow. I'm like I I, I read Hey, SARS-like, I go to the CDC website, SARS-like, oh, often respiratory. Huh, probably need masks. Probably the time like, for masks. Yeah. Like, yeah, I mean. Genius, it, it, you know? It's crazy. Where's my Nobel? Like, Google SARS-like. I was, I, was, I was thinking about this, and now, because my iPhone just recommends everything to me, a year ago, uh, this would have been uh, Iowa caucus week. So uh, during the last Super Bowl, I was in a crowded dive bar in Des Moines watching the Super Bowl. I then went from tiny high school gym to tiny high school gym with people packed in, yelling at the top of their lungs, half of the assembled political media. I then did the same thing in New Hampshire, in Nevada, and in South Carolina before, boom everything changed but it's 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 nuts to think of and this was the first place that i remember hearing about it at all from andrew personally and the weird things podcast yeah uh sadly i <laughs> sadly. know so, so, so <laughs> it turns out number one source for our science news andrew main the weird things podcast that is disturbing. <laughs> that is that is a frightening thought. So Matt Ridley, who is uh, author uh, author, he actually has a back background in science too, but he's you know been more probably known known as a science author. He and Alina Chan, who is a researcher, have put together. There's an article which you can read now on Matt Ridley's blog if you go to Rational Optimist and click blog. And the headline is: Did the COVID nineteen virus really escape from a Wuhan lab? And he and Alina Chan go through this the whole timeline in the history of what's going on there and it is frustrating because it is a question that people don't want to ask and scientists have just sort of shot this down like oh you're saying that it's, a, it's an engineering chimera how dare you that's wrong like one no that's not necessarily a specific claim and two actually you could make chimera viruses that would not be detected there was just a lot of just weird like 
early on when this suggested, there are a lot of people in the scientific community just try to shoot this down immediately without facts, without details. And sometimes people, and this is my lesson for 2020 was like, I always knew that experts are kind of only, only experts in their own field. And then I realized they are narrowly experts within their own field and they yeah. don't realize when they deviate from that, even slightly. Um, and that was a big illustration for me. This was just watching people say things like, no, like we know this isn't likely to be true. And then later on, oh yeah, it turns out this other thing was true. And like, you should have known. But here they point out like, uh, it's really worthwhile reading because I'm not going to do a very good service to it. But there's problems of like missing records, entire like papers that were filed, like, you know, research papers by, you know, uh, by that lab that left out like prior examples of things that were like relabeled, all sorts of other very hanky stuff that you go through there. If somebody was trying to hide an accidental lab leak and you had a very powerful authoritarian regime to help you cover it up, it would look exactly like what's going on right now. The fact that it is a year later and who researchers are finally getting to go to China to go look into this. In every book, every science fiction scenario, it's a week later when the virus breaks out and the team is on the ground finding the case. It is a year later because the Chinese were so resistant towards this. And and let me make it very clear. Part of the reason we know this is because some very brave Chinese people and Chinese researchers have been yep. trying to get the story out and tell us what's going on. And there are heroes over there. There are hero scientists. There are hero people there. And some of them have actually lost their life trying to fight this disease, some of whom have been imprisoned and whatever for trying to help other people understand what's going on, the narrative, and not speaking to whether or not it was lab leaked or whatever, but just people trying to communicate. And so this is, if any criticism, it's towards the government and the bureaucracy, and we will throw that at our shade at our own too. Let me be very clear, because like um, there are some absolutely heroic people over there that have just dealing with a system that for us, it's frustrating on the outside. Imagine being on the inside. So, so, so how much of the narrative that we've heard so far from China can be trusted? And I suppose even as I say that out loud, I know the answer. Um, I assume I, not very I much. I don't, whatever you can confirm, you know, the problem yeah. is, is like, like, where did it come from? Like, that's a question. Where did this come from? I mean, we don't know. I mean, we, we, we're, we're told wet markets, right? And that, but then they discounted the wet markets because, or they remember they still kept the wet markets going. Was it pangolins and whatnot? And then we kept hearing that it was from here, from here. And then we found out some of the earliest cases had no exposure to the wet markets. And, and so, so and, we're, and, and I, I've heard stuff out of Chinese officials that have suggested, oh, it, it might not have even originated in China. It might have originated somewhere else. And we just happened to get a bad case of it, but then took care of it because nobody's. Because of the 300 people that have died in China from COVID, uh, thanks to the heroic work I mean, that's from the one government. Of, that's one of those things where it's like, look, man, uh, uh, scammer to scammer here. Uh, I ain't even going to fault you for lying, but but can I teach you how to lie a little bit better on a world stage? And like, they would look to you and say, yeah, really cute how you lie to dozens of people. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, we're yeah. in the business of industrial strength, billion person lying. Well, Fair also, enough. they... They they don't have to be convinced with their own population. They don't have to be convincing. The lie is just the signal to not talk about it, because then if you talk about it, then you find yourself being spoken to. And that's ultimately the biggest thing. It's like, look, what, what can we know? We know when we see buildings and hospitals being built in Wuhan. We know when we see verifiable elements of uh, uh, you know things being shut down, when, when they're shutting down movie theaters, when they're shutting down. Uh, uh, cities, right? Well, we know that there are certain things that they can't control getting out. Beyond that, who knows? And that's for anybody who's like, oh, this wasn't a lab leak. I'm like, based on all the information I've seen, and this is literally just an outsider who's trying to put something together because my biggest instinct is, can I find out enough to put a story together simple enough that I could repeat it? And that's like, you know, the general idea of a journalist. So every time I read okay. anything here, all I know is that you hit a wall where we're not going to know because China won't let anybody in and, and their word is just unreliable at this point. And if that's the case, then I mean, who knows? Like we, we can take guesses and, and we can, we can have suspicions, uh, but they are, they're valid to me until I see anything else. Let me, I'll paraphrase. I don't want to, it's a lengthy article. And I don't want to uh, read the whole thing, but like 
Part of the story is in 2012, six men clearing bat droppings in a disused copper mine fell ill with some strange disease. And one of the experts who was uh, one of the experts on uh, SARS-like viruses went in to go inspect this, and it realized this was a SARS-like virus. And uh, some of them, some of the tests on these miners were performed at the WIV, which is the lab in question here. And they deduced it was caused by SARS-like COV or bat SARS-like coronavirus. Um, and then they sent several more expeditions there to the, the Mojiang mine to catch sample bats. So this lab had been actually trying to investigate this virus there and looking into this. And apparently they brought back uh, at least nine different SARS-like coronaviruses and some other Chinese labs sampled from there too. And then one of the principal researchers involved here, Dr. Xi, was at a conference when she heard about an outbreak of infectious pneumonia. And this was in 2019 in Wuhan, and she rushed back to find out what's going on. Uh, and then she had wondered, in Scientific America, wondering, could they have come from her lab? And then she concluded, no, they did not. No. Okay. Uh, but anyhow, the point is, is that, let me read this paragraph. Dr. Xi found that part of the sequence of the novel coronavirus SARS-CoV-2 closely resembled a short sequence from a VAT virus her lab had collected Mojang in 2013. <sighs> However, in publishing this finding in her first Nature paper on COVID-19 in February 2020, Dr. Xi made no reference to Mojang or the miners and published the VAT virus under a different name, RA2G13, from the one used previously. Nor did she mention that her laboratory had sequenced and studied RA2G13 as early as 2017 and not after the outbreak of COVID as readers of the Nature paper had understood. And these weren't reversed until another researcher, Rosanna Segreta of the University of Innsbruck in Yuri Dagen of Uther and Genetics, uh, basically went back there and found out that they'd been tipped off by some Twitter user who says, hey, check out these sequences here, check out this stuff here. And they realized that like, names, virus names have been changed, things have been redacted, et cetera. And so there's a lot more going into there of like, just uh, why is this being omitted? Th and this is the problem with restricting information is that I think it'd be fair to say that the three of us and, and, and I don't know, I haven't, I haven't talked about, I haven't talked to Bryce specifically about his <laughs> thoughts on China, but uh, I think that we could be categorized as China skeptics <laughs> in terms of, of, of their forthcomingness of information. And when you have an absence of it, when you have gaps in this, you just simply don't know. And our instinct, our bias will be to fill in with, well, then what are you hiding? And that's what I well, genuinely believe. But the problem is, is like, let, let, me, let, me, let me just give, give an, an example. There right now is a discussion about Clubhouse, the app here in the, uh, you know, made here in the United States. And the discussion here is about how Clubhouse has been denying uh, memberships to journalists because the point of their app that they want to do is create a safe space for people to talk. And so to do that, they want to deny people that they believe are going to violate that and make the experience worse. And it is an invite only thing. It's right there in the name. That's the conversation that's happening in the United States. The conversation that's happening in China is clubhouse got banned today and we're done. That's it. That's a wrap. Oh, oh specifically because it has a focus on, on a, a private experience. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And that's also, it. I don't believe for one second that there's anything private about Clubhouse. There's a reason I have yet to participate in one I mean, look, but again, this is the conversation that you have in a world where we're deciding what levels of free speech we want to have and whether or not it's really private, whether or not it's semi-private, whether or not it should be, if it has an obligation to the press. These are the conversations that you have when you're built on top of this operating system. In China, they don't have it. The government just said... No clubhouse, so you can get around the Great Firewall and do it illegally, but as far as that is, is, is concerned, it got too popular, the government can't control it, and clubhouse isn't based in China, so you're done. Like, and and that's just, just a difference. Let me just add a couple more details here. Uh, so in those papers, no genetic data was provided for the viruses mentioned, and the WIV, that's the lab's virus database, has been was taken offline at the beginning of 2020, and they were told, you know, they told the BBC, oh, it's for security reasons. So their database of virus, they just pulled that offline. They're like, sorry, you can't look at this. It started this whole pandemic. Yeah. And the BBC and Associated Press, they had sent some journalists, and this never got the attention it should have. They sent them to go try to visit the Mojing Mine. They are told by place. They're stopped by these random roadblocks would pop up like, oh, sorry, Wally World. I mean, the world, world uh, you know, road's closed. Um, and... 
they were they couldn't speak to vendors at the seafood markets. Uh, they just weren't. They couldn't. You know, no outside and people been able to even go look at this. And I mean, if you were innocent of this thing, I think you'd be like, uh, "Come, let's go take a look, guys. Let's figure this out." <laughs> you know, this is like Ted Bundy cleaning his VW in front of the police investigators in his driveway because they don't have a warrant. Uh, in my mind, and again, I'm going to stay up front. This is from the mouth of a China skeptic, but I believe full stop, there is a lot more information that we don't know because the government is blocking it. And I personally, if I were making a bet, I would wager <laughs> that indeed there is more culpability on the Chinese government about the spread of this disease than we currently know, uh, uh, if not something as horrifying as, as, as the worst case scenarios that, that have been laid out. I would bet on the worst case scenarios if, if in some bizarre, I don't know what Irish, uh, what, what, what Irish sports book would take those, take that action, but I would lay money down on worst case scenarios. Yeah. I, in absence of anything else, like I, you got, you got to read this. They talk about the pangolin, like, like how, like, the samples and stuff from there, how they're a mess. And there are just so many things that are obvious. It's not like conspiracy theory, like, oh, there's a guy who said this. Or it's like clearly out there. Like, did they shut down the database? Yeah, they did. Did they stop this? Yeah, they did. Why? Well, and I think part of the problem is I think a lot of people and within the scientific community, you have people who look at there's virologists there's the, and the people work together. Like we provided some funding to this lab. We've done this. Also turns out this lab was also dealing, doing military research for the Chinese military. But hey, there is a sense of gathering the wagons and protecting because the fear is like, oh, we don't want, you know, if you're doing this sort of research, you're always feeling kind of threatened because you need to do this research, which means working with dangerous things. And if we don't understand them, then we won't be able to protect against them. And I think that we're seeing some of this sort of people circling their wagons, believing in good faith what their colleagues in China have told them. And thinking like, yeah, we we you know we believe you, and we got to stop this you know this 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 these the dumbs from trying to think that it's anything else. But they've been they've been manipulated, and they're too egotistical or prideful to admit the fact that this is what's happening at this point. Is my opinion. I yeah, I don't know. I I I think it's very very important that we illustrate that what we are talking about here is the. CCP, the Chinese Communist Party, the authoritarian regime that runs that country. I think it's important that we highlight the fact that what we do know is the word of people that were arrested. And in some cases, we still have questions of exactly what happened to them in terms of researchers that got word out before they were they were given a stern talking to. Um, so uh, uh, if. And now we're getting into more kind of like sociopolitical conversation, but China being as big of an economic superpower as they are uh, makes this thing challenging when you're talking about organizations like the WHO uh, and even the way that our own government uh, has to deal with them because we deal with them different than we deal with Mexico, than we deal with. Russia like that is that is not quite the economic superpower that that China is we have to we there's a lot of money invested in our in our relationship and so even in in administrations like the one that that uh like Trump's you saw that he had to you know tiptoe around certain things and and we're certainly seeing that uh, with, with this administration and that's that's hard when when what we really want is information about this globally crippling pandemic <laughs> and i i would add to it's like people say net china will never admit to anything oh you're probably right but that doesn't mean that our own media and our own scientific community has to go along with that and that's been the frustrating part is there's been not enough criticism not a, you if you bring up the idea of of it being a lab leak whatever oh it's a conspiracy theory i can show you articles of people shutting this down by the way i can show articles of like don't worry about covid it's just another flu from people with PhDs and, you know, MDs behind their name. Point is, is that like, there is this on our own side, this unwillingness to even bring attention to it or be critical or skeptical of this or put pressure there. That's what's frustrating. I get an authoritarian regime. They're going to do what they're going to do. We don't have to go along with that. Yeah. You know, we value free speech. We value freedom and we need to, 
you know, when we have people who are preventing that and what's the difference of finding out all the difference in the world, because there were things that they may have known about COVID that could have helped us earlier on, not do our, our, we won't get into the whole no mask mask thing, but anyhow, uh, things about the origins, things about, you know, research they did already having, you know, strains of it that could be researched, looked into what happens with the next thing. If this is the pattern we follow for the next thing that comes along, it's bad. It's very, very bad news for everybody because we haven't really shown that we've learned the lesson from this one, which is um, trust but verify. That's a crucial, te- a crucial tenant. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm having a hard time solving the prisoner's dilemma for any one news organization, though. I mean, it's like you know. Uh, uh, here at the Weird Things podcast, you know, we're able to say, "Hey, this is these are our speculations and opinions," and there's there's not really much of a blowback that we can face uh, by getting canceled by China or whatever. But for major news outlets, uh, w- um, I, I I I understand that they're all defaulting on the prisoner's dilemma, and I understand why, but I don't have a good argument as to what they would gain to make a crusade out of out of calling it out two million dead brian two million people two million people are dead what's the toll next time because we don't put pressure what has been the impact we've been experiencing right now economically for certain news agencies what have you from this i agree short term you go like ah do i really want to and one there is the price of your soul but two because like people die it is literally people dying but second is it like if it happens again, there's an economic impact, and it's a sort of thing where, hey, the, our our playbook for how we handled it is it going to be what we did now? And you know, are we going to go like, oh, we had millions more died? Who could have known? I don't know. Maybe we should have put more attention back when this happened on where this came from and why and how to deal with it. Uh, I get your point 100, percent but I would say that even economically, it's 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 bad in the long run. But I also think the the reasons for not wanting to do this aren't necessarily even that it's that calculated. I think that it's like. You know, we they if you're a news organization, the person you talk to in health or science is going to be your PR or health interface just over there. It's going to be somebody who has a PhD in their name but really hasn't done much work in this field in years, or they're a person that is goes to conferences and stuff and appears to be surface work but isn't particularly knowledgeable. And they're gonna tell you, oh no, that's yeah, that's not really it, we don't get there's not a lot of investigative journalism going on. Most of the stuff I've heard about Bailey has been like BB, you know, the BBC has been trying to push into this even further. But here dropping the ball and i think economically i think it's you know unless you're just flat out worried about oh the chinese are going to stop buying ads on our network that's a reality but there's a lot of other investigators and people out there who could be doing this and even our own government or even our own health officials who should be immune from this have been hesitant to partially because you find out oh so and so is going to investigate the origins of it like wait didn't you work with that lab aren't your friends at that lab (laughs) yeah like this is hardly an independent commission to find out what's going on i think Part of it is also that in our current media landscape, we have a lot of echo, you know, so somebody will, will ask a question and then we've got the Google brigade of, well, I Googled it and this sub and this study says it, it absolutely isn't. And so that's my blog post. And then that blog post gets an echo. And then we go kind of, you know, back and forth. It, it, it's hard to suss out where the real incisive stuff is. But I think, Andrew, your point, which is like, we're not taking enough swings at this. Uh, if, 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 if we are, if our default position is, well, that's a conspiracy theory, let's move on. Then we're, we're by our very nature, not looking as hard as we can to, I mean, the biggest story of, I mean, the last hundred years like can you name a story i mean if if a a, a tenant of news is proximity and therefore a story is bigger by the acreage for which it affects i don't know a large certainly not in my lifetime i can't think of another story that had the kind of effect worldwide for as long as it has had an effect it's it's the literal story I, of the century. May, maybe war on terror. It's hard to, you know, because if we look at sort of the, uh, the you know, we, we look at like, we think like, ah, TSA sucks. Like, 
Yeah, but if you live in the Sudan or you live in, you know, some of these other places that have been in the periphery or whatnot, you know, African countries and other places that affect it, not just the Middle East, you're like, no, you felt an effect on that. Yeah, um, but that, that would be, no. yeah, that'd be true. Uh, but also, if you're in Hong Kong, you'd be watching the TV and saying, man, that's some crazy trash happened between the U.S. Yep. and the Middle East. Yep, yep. Yeah, I agree. But yeah, it's, it's sad, so... Questions are good. Forgiveness is good too. I made a mistake. Cool. I like the fact you told me that. Those are valuable things. Those are those are the, the ability to admit and the ability to accept. Well, yeah. The problem is also systemically with with the Chinese power structure is that they don't exactly get golden parachutes. It's not like it's not like like uh, uh oh. oops, somebody screwed up. Oh well. Uh, go ahead and no, uh, uh, get, get, go to your country home, buddy. You're shamed. Uh, You're canceled on Twitter, Mister. I don't mean them. I don't. I don't mean them. I mean here. I oh, mean yeah, you get yeah. people who who get scientists and researchers who get into a position and then get this double down on it, and then years later you're like, this wasn't true, and they're like, what you don't understand is, and yeah. it's like, yeah, you know, whatever. Any picks? Uh, yeah, I'm listening to a CBC, Canadian Broadcasting Company, podcast uh, called Satanic Panic. Uh, turns out there was a lot of satanic panics, including in the sleepy town of, uh, what, Manitoba, I think, um, in Saskatchewan. Uh, and uh, it's it's really wild to, to hear how there was like a sales pitch complex of, of experts who went around and and sort of sold the uh, <laughs> the 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 story and uh, uh coerced the same story out of all the kids and then everyone was able to say well if it's not real how come they're all telling the same story and the answer is is because there were brand ambassadors going out to teaching people how to extract the same story from all the kids it's uh it's wild stuff and man that's that's a great topic when we talk about the the subject of expertise these people doing this many of them were child psychologists and people who we trusted and would assume that they were impartial you know, people bringing into this and you realize, no, they clearly had their own agenda or their own point of view on stuff. And they would be going to court and they would say stuff that was unchallenged because who would think to challenge, you know, this, this person obviously knows how to talk to kids and interview and do this stuff. And it, it's just that um, I, I want 2021 to be the year that like, great, you got those letters behind your name. We want to see some receipts. Yeah. Uh, my pick is Zillow, Zillow.com. Do you like looking at real estate? Uh, SNL actually had a really funny uh, and almost too uncomfortably close, uh, parody ad for Zillow as a, uh, a, 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 a dirty talk hotline. <laughs> I, I but, mean, it kind of is like I definitely five years ago, put it on my phone. And as I'm driving around in neighborhoods, be like, let me just get a sense let of me Zillow uh, real let quick. Let me just open this up. You're like, ooh, that home is $1.5 million. It's, uh, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, especially in Austin, uh, don't believe the prices, but uh, it certainly is a great resource and it has dominated my browser history over the last month. Uh, cool. Uh, I I haven't been watching very much stuff lately. I've been busy with the Marvel stuff, but uh, WandaVision is still pretty good. Uh, WandaVision gonna, is great. Uh, I think the new episode's uh, uh, pr pretty good. I think it's I think it's winning me over and my icy attitude towards Marvel. Just icy, Brycey. A little bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know. You guys, you guys are watching WandaVision, right? Oh heck yeah! Two thumbs up. Two thumbs up. All right. So WandaVision. Vision. Wander Vision. <laughs> you got to pick Andrew. I do have a pick, and this is a, a YouTube channel I started following just a little while ago. It's called uh, Cool Worlds or Cool Worlds Lab, and the guy does the presentations. I didn't know anything about it. I watched him do like a couple episodes where he's talking about science stuff. I'm like, man, this guy knows his stuff. He seems pretty sharp. You know, he's, he's I'm learning stuff, and I'm like, he's pretty cool. And then uh, I realized that the uh, the guy who does it, David Kipping, is Professor David Kipping, who actually runs an astronomy lab. Um, so I think he's qualified. Uh, <laughs> you know, I think he's legit. And he talks about, he did a really, actually, I went back and I watched the one he did on Umamu, Umumu, um, and talking about A.V. Loeb's, you know, claims and stuff. And I thought he did a really fair job of it. I thought he did a really good job of somebody who was an astronomer who's got skin in the game, 
and he's done some really cool other stuff about a lot of different topics. And uh, again, coming from somebody who is a researcher doing real work, doing, you know, looking for, he's discovered tons of planets, by the way, which I have not done. Um, and so I'm inclined to believe his opinions over my own, but I, it's really cool. So cool worlds lab. And I, cause I remember it's, Oh, it's the cool worlds thing. And he's a pretty smooth talking guy. I just thought he was like some YouTube dude. Didn't realize bona fide real scientist who is very smart and talks about a lot of crazy stuff, which, you know, uh, really interesting. So that's my pick. Nice. Oh, gentlemen. It's been weird. All righty. There we go, everybody. That's weird things. Yeah. We're going to take a minute and uh, come back for some after things talk. Uh, if you need to take a break, now's the time to do it. Cool. Uh, also on after things, um, I got to I gotta zoom at uh, 3.30. So if we can wrap with enough time for me to get on that, that would be good. In 40 minutes? Okay. Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. It's VR, VRB. Ooh. Hello, everybody. Are we Hi, Hello. Bryce. Now we can actually we can look at each other. We we can. Hold on, I gotta pull myself up here. Uh, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Bryce. <laughs> how was uh How was Austin treating you? Uh, you know the only thing that's a bummer mm -hmm. is I have for the last several months through the pandemic mm -hmm. as I became more fitness focused realized that my diet was a huge part of that right in fact we've had a conversation because because you've you've also uh done stuff and like mm -hmm. my big revelation which is not a gigantic revelation it's <laughs> literally the the like lesson of all weight loss yeah. is that like control your diet mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like nail down your diet know what you eat and and eat it every day yeah. and it's just a little step of going from not even thinking about it at all yes. to thinking about it just a very little bit helps so much gigantic helps huge right but what i didn't realize was how difficult it is to recreate what i do <laughs> in my kitchen and or at least mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the pattern right because what you realize is that like i just thought in my head it's easy simple <laughs> uh you know, of uh, 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 the thing I make for breakfast, the thing I make for lunch, mm -hmm. and then a light dinner, good to go. Yeah. But then you realize, oh, no, 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 that's the high concept. That's how you would tell somebody in a conversation. In reality, it's, I get my pan. I have this specific butter that I have. Mm -hmm. I, I pour... I have a, a, a cylinder that measures out exactly the amount of egg whites that uh, I have. Yeah. I then... Uh, uh, have a certain kind of salsa. I have, uh -huh. I have plates now. Right? I will, but uh, now, now I will say, kind of, kind of devil's advocate here. Here in Mar Modern Rogue HQ, we have a hot plate. You have a hot plate, <laughs> right? But then for for lunch, it's like I steam vegetables, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. I usually cook my food in my air fryer. Mm -hmm. And, and now so, what we have a hot plate. You have a hot plate, <laughs> which could steam vegetables. Yeah, it right? could. Yeah. Um. And you've got a, a, a little convec a little. Oh, there is a convection so, down there. Yeah. So I, I could do it. Could do it. But here's the other thing is mm -hmm. that you realize. There's also no groceries here. Well, I, I'd have to go get groceries. <laughs> uh, and you guys do have enough fridge capacity spread out among several mini fridges on the property. But it's there is enough. Thing. Yes. There is enough. <laughs> um, but it's a mess, right? And so it's a mess that I've learned how to go through every day mm -hmm. but also this is a shared space mm -hmm. there this is a workspace this is a workspace yeah. right so the biggest thing that i've had to figure out and i, I went and did a a, a a grocery run today mm -hmm. is just like all right i got to adjust so really let's let's strip that down and let's take it down to the macro understanding that my default is Cool. I'll just go to Torchies whenever I'm hungry. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> like, like this. The substitute here will be fast food salads. Perfect. Yeah. And guess what? They they do a lot of those. It, it can, right? It but can. I'm like, but I know that if that's the case, uh -huh. then I'm gonna get too hungry because I'm gonna delay going to go get a oh. fast food salad, and, and then I'm gonna you're gonna be ravenous. Eating, and you're like, gonna I'm, I'm not setting myself up for for success. So today I was like, all right. I, I, I'm going to understand. I'm going to do frozen stuff. 
So let me just calorie shop mm. on frozen lunches and a breakfast thing mm -hmm. that like soup in a can. Yeah, that, soup in that, a that cup. I, that I just know. I'm like, okay, it's gonna be simple. It's gonna be easy. I'm not gonna leave a mess. I'm not gonna worry about cleaning. Mm. But I'm putting my thought into my week's worth of food that I'm going to be here. Yeah. And 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 that's that. But that's that's honestly. And then I bought a bunch of snacks that I normally so I eat like a metric ton of grapes and mm. carrots. That's good for you. Grapes. So I, have, you know, I have grapes and carrots here if anybody wants any. <laughs> I like like all here like you know they like get the documentaries and stuff about like vegan like if you eat like vegan like you know you can be super healthy and maybe weight lift and all that of course like the bodybuilders doing that are probably up you know all using human growth hormone but anyhow i believe that like oh you can go vegan and you can be healthy and all. i believe that i also believe in my kitchen i could probably make I don't know, amino acids and proteins and maybe basic cellular life if I know how to cook it right and organize it right. But uh, man, that's really hard. And, and that's like with veganism, like, yeah, I believe you, but every time I see about like, here's ID vegan, it sounds like a chemistry project and how to mix and get these things right. If you, if you want uh, to gain muscle mass um, going vegan, and Ashley's tried it, I've had other friends that have tried it, and I've worked with a personal trainer that was working with somebody else to do it, it requires, I mean, any kind of actual bodybuilding in general, you need to eat a ton of protein. Like that is just a part of the process. And it is harder to do when you can't just eat a bunch of steak and chicken. Uh, 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 super, super quick, Justin, do you need to go take a break? No. Uh, and Brian, is your Zoom call in the studio? Yeah. Or? Okay, so then we need to. Yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. <sighs> okay. Then, uh, then we need to get started and we need to keep this to about 20 minutes after the hour all right that's that's cool. going to be a hard limit on that everybody all right uh starting uh counting you down andrew in three two hello and welcome to the after things podcast Nate landed it, it. Woo! landed it man Woo! It's the pressure like you're landing on the stuff. I, you know Bryce, the, of course conditions. i still love you yeah <laughs> it's conditions Hello and welcome to the After Things Podcast. I'm Intermean, joined by Justin Brian Young. Yes, no, the double landing it, man. <laughs> no, I, I keep all that. of this <laughs> in. We got it. Yeah. All right. Fusion ha. <laughs> Hello and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Main with Justin Robert Young. Hey. Brian Brushwood. Textbook. And Bryce Taskmaster. Yeah. And, <laughs> and I see Brycey Castillo. I see Brycey Castillo. Hello, everybody. <laughs> so uh, I want to start off with the top. Bryce, uh, here you had a little run through with your marbles. We did. Our first kind of debut day was uh, on Sunday. Oh, yeah. You did a, 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 you called it Duper Bowl, the which Duper I Bowl. thought was really good. Yeah. I, I like that name. We gave out the plastic cup. Uh, to to three of our competitors who who finished in, in the night. It was great. We had, uh, I think, the highest turnout I've seen in any of the marble stuff we've ever done. Oh wow! Uh, which was a lot of fun. And also, uh, uh, you know, for for the after things audience, which is uh, 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 an exciting bit, uh, we had uh, sponsors. We were actually sponsored uh, 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 from some fellow <laughs> Diamond Club listeners who were excited. And so, oh fun! Uh, that was really cool. Um, I think we talked last week about the acrylic gift that we're going to give the champion. Yeah. Um, so they're sponsoring, but then a, a, a someone who who makes some podcasts was like, "Hey, I got some podcasts I would like to promote," and it was uh, it was great. So, uh, and it was fun. Uh, if that's you, awesome. If yeah. if you don't mind sharing in hard numbers, mm -hmm. like what what does a a biggest turnout yet look like? Um, I, I haven't looked at the viewer numbers yet, but uh, we had uh, across all the races. The you know you can look at how how many yeah. people enter the races. We averaged about a hundred people every race, awesome. um, which is a hundred people watching the stream and typing a thing in chat when it's their time. So right. your concurrents were probably anywhere between a hundred hundred fifty. Then I would I would guess possibly right? Twitch's the the mysterious number on Twitch is six hundred and seventy eight views, but that is. No, that's, 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 that's the VOD. That's a, yeah, so, that, that's but, after the fact, right? No, those are com they've combined those now. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And so that is comparable to uh, uh to a cord killer stream in case but uh, the but there are they're weird that that number is very weird. I don't trust it. But uh, but that the, it was great to see the most participation really that we've seen yet. And that's what I think and that's the metric that you know for years 
you know, the problem we had in podcasting is you'd be like, oh, I've got 10,000 listeners on my podcast. And people are like, well, our blog had 180,000 visitors last month. And you're like, bots, not what I want, whatever. And it's mm -hmm. like, I will, let's compare my 30 second ad with your banner on your blog and we'll see. Well, and, then, well, and and, and you know, I think this this goes back to, you know, uh, you guys have heard me talk about the story, attention, sales, different currencies. Like the thing about attention is if you truly think of it as real estate in the mind, the only way to know how much there is, is by asking for an action or asking for a, a sales or a money or whatever. Mm -hmm. Everything else is BS. Like we have proxies that imply, you know, like if, if, if the view count on a YouTube video is very high, it is implied that a lot of people saw it, but you don't know how deeply they cared about it, how much it right. resonated, whether or not they consider themselves part of your tribe. And that data is you. tough to express in a meaningful way, right? Well, there's a million minutes viewed on this video. Well, is that a million people watching one minute? Is that 10, right. pe 10 million people? people watching for a, a tenth of a second and, and weird, but, weirdly yeah. the only way for you to measure that real estate is by is by asking whether it's an offer for a sales thing or or asking people to sign up for a newsletter or to show up in the chat for concurrent you know to like yeah. like for you uh that's one of the nice things about the marbles is that it's, everybody to play has to do mm -hmm. a thing right and so you you know for a fact that every time you said go a hundred people uh, mm -hmm. that, that your, your, your acreage was a hundred people wide yeah. every single and, time. And the really great thing about that number, just seeing the trend of it is that, you know, there, there's a little bit of a parabola to it. Uh, you know, that it, it, it takes time for people to get in. And as it starts to get later in the night, people are logging out. But I mean, even the lowest number was over 90 people. Like it was very consistent, especially in a way that that we had not seen in, in some of these other streams. So were, were people able to participate uh, participate in multiple heats? They they were able to go again. Every race. Okay. Uh, there were eighteen races or so. So yeah. every, every every race, everybody got a chance to press the button, and a lot and plenty of people did. Um, and so that's that's one of the really kind of nice things about the the way we've got the data stuff set up is that I can see literally everyone uh which race everybody entered and and how all that stuff tracked throughout it the night. actually gives you some valuable intel as far as how to interpret the the fake numbers that we see in like you you yeah. talked about the mysterious twitch number like um I, I i'm not gonna like i might tune in and not participate just because like uh, you don't want to do a thing you want to well, watch well, I, which is exactly, how a lot of people on twitch right, are like. i just want it on right yeah. and it, but but like that valuable intel of knowing that 80% of everybody who's showing up is there because they're all the way in and they're playing along. Um, man, no, those metrics are going to be really, really valuable. Mm -hmm. I, I would consider continuing to, it'll take even more effort on your part, but I would consider logging uh, all the metrics of everything so that you could eventually do kind of a case study to sort of interpret, you can map out mm -hmm. what that what that real estate of the mind looks like. Yeah, you know, um, uh, that is that is not impossible to kind of archive that data and make sure it's available. Because kind of with the way the some of the point stuff is set up, like when we start the week one proper on Thursday, then a lot of stuff is going to get wiped or a lot of stuff is going to kind of get baked to uh, non live data, um, but. But you can copy stuff and keep keep it in, in the back burner. But yeah, it's it's really interesting. And, and I wasn't even really expecting um, that kind of immediate analysis you could do of like, here's how many people entered all of the races. Here's how here's all of this great stuff. Um, and it was great to see a, a huge turnout. So, uh, uh, yeah, I, I like I said before, like that. And what Brian alluded to is that that whole metric of how engaged people pressing buttons and stuff, I think we're going to, that's going to be the new podcast. That's going to be the new, now people realize, oh, podcast advertising is actually effective. Really? You think people like selecting something, putting something in bubble, a bubble with just you and the person <laughs> podcasting has value? You're like, now, how about this game master who gets people pulled into a zone and have them pressing buttons on command? Yeah. Like, what's the value of that? Well, and and it, and it keeps people really really engaged um you know uh i it's 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 fascinating and i and i, and, uh, I, I do want to go and dive into the twitch stuff i haven't had any time to since uh, but i would like to go and see kind of what we have a good idea of not just you know the twitch uh has a has a delineation of chatters people who are in the chat but uh uh um 
uh, uh, but it would be interesting to see the, the the ratio of how many people really were viewing and for what length and then how many people were involved with the races uh, because what? I think there could also be that second undercurrent. I mean, we, you know, we do podcasts here. A lot of people just don't, they just watch, you know, they don't have any want to be in the chat room. And that's, a, you know, those people are there. They, they may not, we may not see them, but they're there. We almost certainly have just suggested this flow to this before, but, but have you, have you reached out directly to the folks who created the software for marbles and started chatting with them? Uh, no, I haven't opened up those lines. I haven't sent that, that out yet. I was, there's been finalizing all the stuff has been tough, but the, I, I think in the next week I'm going to start doing that. Oh, now would be the, now would be a well, great time. It, yeah. Especially is, uh, uh, don't, don't harvest that connection, but instead just give them the gift of, Hey, we like it a lot. We care a lot. Look at what we're doing with it. Bye. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then and then a week later, hey, we're also doing this other thing. Bye. And then third week, hey, we want to do something even crazier. Would you be interested in? Mm -hmm. Like, like, like that's um so many of the uh the most rewarding relationships that that I've had professionally. Like I I I've mentioned multiple times the Under the Influence podcast uh, uh from CBC which is a uh, you know 20 30 year ad uh, award winning ad veteran talking about like what are good ads what are bad ads and branding and all that stuff mm -hmm. and um uh, I just sent an unironic fan letter another unironic fan letter and then it wasn't until like a few weeks ago that I'm like hey I'm working on this weird thing would you be interested and he was like yeah let's hop on a call now this is somebody who if I just picked up the phone it was like I would like to book 30 minutes of your time to talk about a brand opportunity that like that'd be 10 or $20,000. But instead he's, you know, this is because I had built up the value of like, I'm just a guy who loves your stuff and I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm really listening and, and appreciating what you have to say. Uh, it was a delightful conversation. And I can't wait to, uh, uh, you know, follow up with it. I, I would. Yeah. I, I would say don't overthink your <laughs> instinct to just pull up and compliment him. Yeah. Like, it, it make it short, make it punchy. Like, hey, just want to say, love the game. Uh, I'm doing this thing that uses it. Uh, keep being great. Uh, uh, and if you have any kind of question about the product, of like, hey, like, uh, uh, uh well, actually, no, don't, don't, yeah, don't, I, don't, I, don't I, do any. To, to be honest, I, I might even stop short of I'm doing this thing. I like just say, I really like your thing specifically. I've noticed that it's really magical for this specific thoughtful reason. Thank you for everything you've done. I, mm. I would say if Bryce is doing something like this, where he's like well, made yeah, a I league, guess, yeah. it's a big special thing that shows off their product. Like, I think that it's fine for him to be like, yes. hey, I put a ton of effort. This is how much I love it. Uh, but make it, sell it in, in the email as more of you're, you're a bringing celebration a lot of, of the game, not the like... World. Yeah. yeah, my business plan no, is, no, no, no. is is right, as right, right. follows. Right. I'm icy Brycey and I'm ready to <laughs> I'm ready to make oh, some cold hard cash. <laughs> so I have a I have a little maybe thing to think about. And uh. for people who like when a thing is ready, when a thing's like good enough, here's something to think about. I once worked on a TV pilot with a production company that had like a first look deal with MTV. And we finished the pilot edited it looked good i was very happy one of the pilots i'm actually the most happy with ever it's actually the first one I ever did and it was making it was a pain but the end product was pretty good and justin was involved mm -hmm. and they wanted to sort of like they weren't they wanted to renegotiate my contract because i went in and i had a pretty good contract with them and they wanted to renegotiate the contract because they were like uh we want we want a higher percentage we want a percentage of this whatever and they decided to play this game where they were going to kind of sit this thing out I went in and I got ICM as my agency, which was great because they had their legal and stuff. So it was kind of, it did not work out to their advantage. Let me put it that way, because I'm like, well, then I need representation now. Let me go get representation. And I brought in, you know, I got a, you know, one of the most powerful firms at the time. And so finally like, okay. And they sat on this thing. We were going to turn it in, but they sat on this for like three weeks, right? Yeah. Before they turned it in. They waited three weeks. They go send it in to MTV. And, and I know enough now to know when these stories are true, probably, uh, and when, no, but the chain of events was MTV said, wow, this is great. Unfortunately, we just bought a magic slash product sh magic show uh, a week ago. Oh no. Had we seen this, 
we would have gone with this. And the mm-hmm. production company was like devastated because they were like, they were that close. Super close, yeah. That close. Oh, geez. Uh, and and, and that, it, is, it is the kind of situation that only the decision-making at the leadership of that particular production company, <laughs> you know, could, could muster. Uh, yeah. uh, Man. Yeah. I, that the the only uh, closest but, parallel to that crazy market is is the Austin housing market. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, no, sorry, yeah, finish your thought, Andrew. Yeah, so I would say that like I, for me, I wasn't like bummed out though because I was like, this production company was a nightmare to work with, and I don't know what it'd been like to have to work with them another year or a couple of years on this thing because it probably would have driven me up the wall. So it was sort of a win in a way, but still, it was that we're gonna sit on this because what could happen. Well, that happened. Yeah, <laughs> that's what happened. Yeah, Mm-mm. uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think that just uh, connect. Yeah. I think that that we 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 all we often put too much pressure uh on on ourselves, but at the same time, like uh, and this is something that I think Brian has has done a good job of, at trying to break down uh my own instincts on it. But like, just if you see something you like. Hit them up with an email. Just get used to pulling up and saying, hey, your stuff is great. I love it. Because from our perspective, and that's the thing, we're, we are creators. If somebody just randomly pull ups and compliments you, you're like, thank you. Well, and, and, Thank and, and you and for course, doing that. You, you feel that bristling like, are you going to ask for something? And it's like, no, not asking for anything. Just want to say it's great. Yeah. And then, and then what's, uh, uh, and again, if you want to be Machiavellian about it, then when you do have something to ask, you can just uh, uh, reply to that same thread and they'll see like, uh, who's this person? What were we talking about? Mm-hmm. And what we were talking about was you're great from six months ago. Yeah. And it's like, okay, well, this guy seems cool. Yeah. Uh, one of the other things uh, that uh, I was able to get, you know, everybody's kind of reaction from during, during the stream and, and see how people enjoyed it was um, uh, I had put together these little uh uh, video like kind of highlight little packages um, to kind of just give me a two minute break, you know, yeah. in the middle of the stream. And people really seemed to like it, which was which was good. You know, I was worried, you know, a bit about, you know, we talked about having a very having, you know, needing an engaged kind of player base. And I was almost worried of like, well, if I keep them away from format for two minutes, you know, are they going to when are they going to think about it? And, and it turns out at least people who, who mentioned, you know, uh, seem seem that they really liked it. So, you know, um, that, that, uh, was a, 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 a certain amount of work to kind of build out templates and stuff for that. But, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm very glad it was all really well received. Yeah. From a humble beginning, the red marble <laughs> had no idea what future lay before him <laughs> in a neighborhood filled with blues. He felt like an outcast, unliked, <laughs> unloved. Um, also the email list using Substack, man, it is night and day from using MailChimp. I can, I can, I can just, you can just write it and you can just send it and it's not this whole, now you got to design it and you got to, you're like, whoa, buddy, whoa, buddy. You realize you're about to send an email, right? Right. And it's like, they literally, MailChimp has a moment with a, little, a, with okay, a sweating button. finger <gasps> about to, like, yeah. just, are you ready for this? Are you about to send that email? <laughs> I, I finally got out completely off MailChimp. I uploaded everything to Substack. I haven't sent anything out yet, but I was like, I like I got like, oh, here's your MailChimp bill, $150 this month. Oh, by the way, you sent zero emails. Yeah. Ooh. Also, because like we know you have like 10,000 people, but we count it as 20,000 because of our monkey this math. Weird thing, and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, F you. I just, I'm like, I'm done. I'm done. It, it, I, it, I just, it, I didn't it, even know it, where I was going to go. It's just not for that. It's mm-hmm. not for that. And 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 they are an enterprise level product. It makes a lot of sense for scam stuff. I was about to say it's like my bill's eight hundred dollars a month. <laughs> but, but for you, you know there's there's a very healthy graph yeah. of oh look, it's eight hundred dollars, but right. let's bring it in. This MailChimp money. has become a product for you yes. and not for me doing a political newsletter, not for Andrew doing a newsletter keeping his fans involved in what he is doing and not for Bryce to let people know that the marbles league is starting. Yeah. This. And, and I, I will th- even argue, was it Brian? I'd even argue that if you, the amount of, 
do you know how cheap it is to send an email on Amazon's like simple email service and to do like almost everything you're doing? The amount of work that I went through to go send a thing on MailChimp, I went over, like, I looked over at Amazon at SE. I'm like, it's 10,000 emails for $2 is like the price to send. Yeah. The, the trick though, is that uh, I, I trust, um, I trust them to be whitelisted uh, in their servers and, and have a greater likelihood of getting stuff into the right pocket instead of going straight to spam or promotions or whatever mm. they use the same service as amazon does but if it gives you confidence that's fine i will not try to talk to you out of it i mean look no no no. but no this is why enterprise works right like you why, get someone why, to why, say why hey does, this is a problem i need you this why, is like, your responsibility why are businesses still paying for yeah. microsoft office suite when right. literally they can do everything on google for free because this is a thing that works well, we're going to go well with it i also it's different. That's different. Like this literally, and again, I'm saying Brian's probably fine with what he has, but I'm saying is like, it is a, those are two different products. This, the Amazon's SM simple email service is literally, it's the thing with it's, it's this, it's whitelisting. All that other stuff is there. It's just a little bit harder to dig into and it may not be worth yeah. it to, for him to dig into it. But there are a lot of people. I had a friend that was doing Kickstarter campaigns and they had to manage, you know, 80,000 people or whatever like this. And they're frustrated with MailChimp. I'm like, use this system. And he's like, he spent a few days, got into it. He's like, oh my God, change the difference. Now yeah. he's saving thousands of dollars by doing it this way. Mm -hmm. um, and also the other the other thing I've I've liked about having the Substack is that it basically functions as like a second website, right? Like you kind of get a little bit of archive of the updates for everybody. It, it, it you know, Substack knows when you're coming in and you are not like logged in. So uh, the first time you load up, it, it it says like, hey, you should subscribe or you could just read everything, but you should subscribe first. Um, and so even if what I'm doing is like mirroring, you know, some of some of this content that might be news posts on the marbles.win website or or whatever, like it 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 functions as, as a really nice, simple uh, secondary outlet for a lot of this information. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. And then we yes, we also had some uh, some waterworks on uh <laughs> right before the halftime show wait what uh so mike tv did it did uh, a really stellar halftime oh, show oh that's for us. great did he do it live no he pre-recorded oh, wow. it he pre-recorded it and that's then fun we've got the little emote thing so we we blocked him out uh so why that... could he have done the super bowl instead of the <laughs> the weekend the weekend was all right but so i was doing one of these i was i had set these ad reads up for right before the uh right before that little halftime show and i wanted to test out their bottle opener live on the air oh no because it's kind of an untraditional sort of it, it it looks a little weird but i wanted to make sure it worked and so i pulled up uh, i had a little uh uh little, little, oh, little mick ultra a little weird. mick ultra yeah that's right a mick ultra and look it, it worked it popped it up oh, oh! <laughs> i swear this I'm never TV. happens <laughs> let's turn it over to netflix now let's watch a movie so, thankfully we had mike's 11 minute performance where i could dry everything off that's <laughs> perfect that's awesome yeah that's great um but yeah and thank thank you guys for your advice i mean i think uh a, a lot of stuff uh would not be the, the way it is uh uh without it so uh nice. no that that looks awesome i love the look of it i love the color scheme i think it looks super fun uh, uh I'm, I'm i'm pumped to see it grow thank you uh hey real quick fast pick um i mentioned fast the pick. under the influence podcast uh he has a book terry o'reilly has a book it's called this i know uh i'm only at the beginning of it uh in and there's a lot of stuff that i've heard over the years of his of his podcast but mm. uh dude knows his salt and uh he's a good good guy this i know from terry o'reilly very cool uh I'll, I'll double down on substack substack is uh if you if you have an audience for anything if you enjoy writing anything, to me, Substack is, to our modern world, what a blog was to the early aughts. It's what a Twitter account was to the tens or, or a Facebook community. It is just a thing you should be involved in uh, uh, if you have an audience or, or want to write anything. Mm. Uh, uh, go and I've been looking for a blog alternative for years and years this is the closest thing you can get to that and and actually get to your audience unfettered yeah they made they made one and they it's called email yeah it's, it's called email look at that uh, uh my pick i got one i got another one of these for the for that for the for the duper bowl and it helped out a lot i got a, a another elgato stream deck uh i think the the really cool thing about these is uh you know you can go and get a little numpad 
device and you can set it up with custom keys and all that stuff. There are whole ways you can you can DIY it. But the software and the integrations that they've got with the Elgato is is worth more than the cost of of admission. The fact that I mean, they have OBS and vMix and the voice meter thing that I use for for audio. Like they have just integrations with all that stuff. So you're not picking and trying to find keyboard shortcuts. There's just has someone made it. And so you can say this button mutes this, this button does this, and you can chain stuff together. I think it's it's a it's a really one of their strongest devices that they got and and pretty affordable for as much power as, as you get out of it. So the Elgato Stream Deck. Clutch. I'm going to double, triple down on the Substack. I have not published my first thing there, but listening to what Justin said about it, and it does look like a a a modern solution to you know where we need to be with communicating stuff and just seeing it grow. So I'm andrewmain.substack.com. So if you want to start following me there, then yay, yeah, check yeah, out. get on it, cool, yeah. All right, everybody, it's yeah. been after. Ooh. 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 Damn. Shutting it down with Icy Bricey. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Chill. For all of that. He's out. We'll be back at uh, 6 Central for Cord Killers. Sub Zero. <laughs> I think we've got, got Meryl bar, bar on this week, so that'll be fun. The Meryl Bar? The Meryl Bar. The Meryl Bar. All right, everybody. Have a good one. Bye. Meryl Bar? <laughs>